Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Daniel here with another From the Bookshelf book review. Today we are looking at The Hunting of Four Said by Richard Howe. So the full title of this book is The Hunting of Four Said, the real story behind Britain's greatest modern naval disaster. On the blurb it says, Four Said was the name given to the British battle fleet that sailed to Singapore in the autumn of 1941. Its mission to defend the whole of both Australia and New Zealand should Japan declare war. But behind the name hid only the battered Prince of Wales and the 25 year old cruiser Repulse. And they arrived in the East only five days before Japan attacked Pearl Harbour. Richard Howe, the author of The Fleet That Had to Die and The Potomkin Mutiny, vividly describes the ensuing tragedy and charts in detail the controversial action taken by Forsyth's Admiral Tom Phillips. So this book was published in 1974. It's a reprint from 1963. It's when the original was published. It's by Nell Paperbacks. All told, it is 159 pages long. Of that, 154 pages are text. Uh, this is a fairly small book. And with that in mind, the writing is fairly small. But at the same time, for a book of this size, you know, the writing is not as small as it could otherwise be, so it's the size of the book, it's not too bad. Um, so, there's a couple of things with this, and the things which really I don't like about it. So, first of all, is the layout in terms of the chapters. There's no sort of structure to the book in as much as um, chapter 6 begins halfway down page 76. You know, chapter 7 begins halfway down page 88, which I find a little bit annoying to a degree. I mean, there is the contents in the front which tells you when all the chapters begin, but to have it begin halfway down a page, so you sort of finish chapter 5, move straight to chapter 6 on the same page, you know, I don't like that layout, but that's just my personal preference. But it's with the content of the book that I've got the biggest um, bones to pick, shall we say. So, starting with the blurb, it refers to the battle cruiser Repulse. Sorry, the cruiser Repulse shows a battle cruiser. And for a book which charts the sort of conception of foresaid, and why it was sent to the Far East in 1941. It takes a long time to get there. So, for those that aren't aware, in late 1941, well, it began in August, there was a whole host of rows between Churchill, the War Cabinet, and the Admiralty over what to do in the Far East. So, Britain had, in the late 1920s and early 30s, it came up with the idea of the Singapore strategy, whereby the fleet base was constructed in Singapore and it was anticipated that in the event of a war in the Far East, the main fleet, mainly that which was based in British waters, the home fleet, as it was in sort of by the outbreak of war in 1939, would sail from British home waters to the Far East and would act as Britain's main fleet in the Far East. Um, and with the outbreak of war, obviously things changed. The home fleet was needed in home waters. And, you know, by 1940 it was there to help fight the threat of invasion. It was also stretched, so the rally was also stretched in guarding the convoys across the Atlantic. Then in June 1940, with the Italian declaration of war, the Mediterranean 
complete growing prominence and the weight of responsibility that was put on the Mediterranean fleet was increased with the French surrender because you know, the British and French fleets had divided up the Mediterranean into the East Mediterranean and West Mediterranean and all of a sudden with the French surrender you know the role of the French Navy was well, removed which meant that under Admiral Cunningham the Mediterranean fleet had the whole Mediterranean to look after. I mean I know Force H was conceived which acted as a bit of a de facto battle group supplementing the Mediterranean fleet to a degree um, but it was very much standalone and sort of conducted its own missions. So with that sort of the Singapore strategy went out the window you know Britain then didn't have the ability just to move an entire fleet from home waters and from the Mediterranean to meet any threat in the Far East. So a row began to erupt. So what Churchill thought of doing was to send one battleship of the King George V class and he wanted HMS Duke of York which had just been completed earlier in 1941 and what he wanted to do was to send her along to the Mediterranean, uh, sorry, to the Far East to act as a fleet in being. And he argued that the Germans had just a handful of warships, such as Scharnhorst Neisner, then at Brest, or sort of turbots working up in the Baltic, which were tying down a vast amount of British naval resource on the off chance that they might break out. So, what Churchill thought was that. A King George V class battleship sent to Singapore would have the same effect on the Japanese as what the German warships were having on the Royal Navy. The Admiralty at the time was thinking about sending HMS Renown and also some of the Revenge class battleships but Churchill viewed sending the Revenge class because in his words they were coffin ships. Arguably that was partly borne out by the tragic loss of life on board HMS Royal Oak when she was sunk in Scarpa Flow when over 700 members of her crew were killed when she was sunk by U-47. Um, so, while Churchill was persistent with having HMS Duke of York sent, the Admiralty viewed that idea on the grounds that because she was new, you know, should be untried, most of her ratings were hostilities only ratings, so to send her there untried, untested and working up would potentially cause problems and would be issues that she would never recover from. So after much debate it was agreed that Prince of Wales would be sent. Now when Prince of Wales was selected she'd been sort of thrown in at the deep end so in May 1941 she'd fought the Bismarck and had been damaged. Famously she'd sailed to intercept the Bismarck with men from Vickers Armstrong still on board sorting out problems with the main armament. She then sailed over to um, Newfoundland in August, carrying Churchill and well on board Churchill and Roosevelt had conduct the Atlantic Charter and then she'd sailed into the Mediterranean as part of Operation Halberd which was a convoy escort mission to Malta and from there she was sent out to the Far East the Admiralty also agreed to send the Battlecruiser Repulse because she was operating out in the Far East at the time and it was planned that an aircraft carrier would also be sent but unfortunately the aircraft carrier selected ran aground off Jamaica whilst working up. So what said ultimately was highly publicised or rather Prince of Wales was and that was all in the deterring the Japanese but so what Britain didn't realise was that the Japanese were basically putting plans here to attack obviously Pearl Harbour but also to attack the ships of force said as the squadron was known um, so specific air groups were put together which were to operate from French Indochina specifically to hunt any ships that Britain sent to the Far East very little of that is actually conveyed in this book. So as I mentioned, the actual text is 154 pages long. The first 90 pages 
are all dealing with sort of stuff which may be deemed irrelevant to the story, such as the conception of the submarine and the conception of the torpedo. But while torpedoes did feature sort of quite prominently in the engagement in that it was the torpedoes that did the most damage to the Prince of Wales and to the Repulse and sunk them. To dedicate 90 pages to the conception of the submarine, to the development of the torpedo, is just a little bit laborious. And because of that, and obviously the subsequent length of the book, sort of all this stuff was sort of glossed over. I mean, the final page of the book, or two pages, deals with the sinking of the Prince of Wales. So, page 153, Prince of Wales is still afloat. On page 154, she keels over and sinks, and basically the last paragraph says that the captain of the Prince of Wales, Captain John Leach, was found floating face down in the water. An hour after his ship went down, Tom Phillips, the Admiral Commanding Force said, was never seen again. And that was that. It ends with the words, the end. So effectively what the book does is it charts the conception of the torpedo of the submarine a little bit on the development of aircraft, on the development of battleship armour, the whole debate about battleship versus submarines, and then says a fleet was sent to Singapore, the Japanese attacked it on the 10th of December, Repulse and Prince of Wales were sunk, Captain of the Prince of Wales was found floating face down dead, Admiral Phillips was never seen again, the end, end of the story. Which doesn't really do the story justice because it is a very interesting story and it's one that deserves more credit. I mean, I would say that Martin Middlebrook's book, Battleship, is a far better work. Now, that was published in 1974. That's when the first print came out. And it's twice as thick as this book. You know, it's the best part of 250 pages. You know, borderline 300. And the question is why? I mean, Yes, this particular book was reprinted in 1974, but the original was published in 1963? 60? Sorry, 1963. So one thing that I can't help but think of is that sort of wartime secrecy played a role. So, I mean, we all know the story of Ultra and how sort of the role of Bletchley Park was kept a secret well into 21st century and that most government documents don't have a time limit put on them so they can't be released for 30 years, 40 years or you know they might have stamped on not to be released until 2022 for example. Um, so I'm, I can't help but wonder if perhaps secrecy in that regard played a role in that Richard Howe was writing the book when sort of he didn't have full access to all of the information and that by the time Martin Middlebrook came to write his book approximately 10 years later, he had a lot more information to go on. That's just one idea. I mean, what is disappointing is that so Middlebrook has, or in his work, he conducted interviews with the survivors and their recollections were weaved into the narrative. None of that is in the Hunt of Force said, it's very much matter of fact, this happened, that happened, and the other happened. It's very bish, bash, bosh, A, B, C. It's, um, yeah. If I have to be honest, because of the way the book is, I would like to have gave up on it, because it is really a disappointment. I mean, I've never given up on the book and I don't think I ever will because I always like to think that if someone's taken the time to have written the book, they've spent all their time and effort conducting research and then drafting the book, writing it, that I will take the time to read it, no matter how good or bad. But 
But had I not sort of felt that way, I would have given up on this. I mean, if you are interested in sort of the development of the weapons, then it's great. But in terms of actually telling the story for said, then it is poor effort. It's quite a disappointment. I mean, I was looking forward to reading this book because, well, with it being published when it was published, I think all the books tend to have something about them in the way that they convey the story that is sometimes lacking in modern books. It's not something I can exactly put my finger on. I think it, it partly has to do with the fact that sort of books in the 50s, 60s, 70s, particularly the likes of these, were written by individuals of the wartime generation. So Richard Howe had been a pilot during the Second World War for, so he flew typhoons. Um, I think his book was called One Boy's War. So he sort of he knew what it was like to experience combat during the Second World War. And that comes across in sort of other books by other authors, such as um, Ludwig Kennedy's Pursuit about the hunting of the Bismarck. Um, whereas if you compare that to, I don't know, Ian Ballantyne's book, Killing the Bismarck, well, Ballantyne's book is a fantastic book. There's something about which means that it's not quite told in the same manner that Ludwig Kennedy's book is, even though Valentine has a lot more information available to him. And I was hoping it was going to be the same with this, but unfortunately it wasn't. It's um, quite a disappointment, I have to admit. Yeah, I would like to have read more about sort of the arguments that raised between Churchill and the Admiralty into what ships were sent to Singapore and why. I'd like to have read more on so, uh, so Tom Phillips's plans for engaging the Japanese invasion force, I believe, to be off Malaya. You know, about the Japanese plans to hunt force said itself, the actions of the Japanese submarines that tracked the ships of force said, and then of the Japanese airmen when they're conducting the attacks. Even so, to have got an insight of what was like on board the destroyers whilst the big ships were under attack but unfortunately all of that is lacking which is disappointing and um, there is better books out there on the hunting of four said and personally if i had have known what this book was about or rather what exactly it covered beforehand that it was going to be sort of about pretty much everything bar the hunting of four said, then I probably wouldn't have picked it up in the first place. But that's just my thoughts on it, you know, my opinions. Someone else might pick this up and thoroughly enjoy it, and it might be their favourite book. But um, if you've read this book, you know, it'd be great to hear from you. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Please remember to like this video if you've enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future updates, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you.